The Software Defined Networking and Open Flow webinar was made possible by the sponsorship of Big Switch Networks. Big Switch Networks are developing an SDN application for network virtualization, and you can get their open source SDN controller called Floodlight at the openflowhub.org. You can find Big Switch at bigswitch.com. This webinar is just one of many vendor independent data center and virtualization webinars available on IP Space. To learn more about them, visit ipspace.net. And don't forget that you get immediate access to all of them with a yearly subscription. Okay, so let's talk about controllers. So just a quick reality check. So for all the hype and breathless excitement that many people get about OpenFlow at this point, OpenFlow doesn't let you do anything that you couldn't do on a network before, right? So at the end of the day, um, packets are still rooted, frames are still forwarded, and the hosts get their frames. Nothing actually changes. And as as uh, Ivan Pepelniak says, you don't need OpenFlow to solve every age-old problem. So coming back to the question that was just asked, is you know OpenFlow isn't going to just obsolete the entire networking industry overnight. There is still a place for OSPF and BGP and you know Spanning Tree and Trill and all those things. But there are other solutions where OpenFlow is going to be better, and maybe even both. Okay, so OpenFlow doesn't solve um, could solve part of your old problems, could solve all of them if you're a certain type of network, but it might not others. And it's also point out that it's very, very early stage. You've got to remember that this has all come up in less than 18 months in a very real sense. There are commercial products that are shipping, of course, and that's what makes it uh, a reality check, is that for all the people who sit there and say, oh, it's all hype, it's nothing, but, uh, you know, really, there are things out there and there's an awful lot of interest going on. Okay. So just to backtrack, today your routing protocols or your spanning tree or your trill or whatever it's called or whatever proprietary name you want to have for it determines near the forwarding table in your network. OpenFlow is just another method for configuring the FIB in your networking switch slash router. <laughs> the switch operating system handles device management and operations just like it does today and you might still use spanning tree OSPF anyway. OpenFlow describes a solution for each frame or packet flow and you use wildcards to provide granular control to suit. So your controller sits to the side of your network. So what I've done here is created a plane in the, in the right hand side here where the servers and the switches are all connected together. And your controller will need to derive the desired forwarding path in software, right? And then send OpenFlow messages that update the forwarding table in the networking device. The messages that the controller sends to the switches either add, update, or delete entries in the forwarding table, right? And the forwarding table itself, of course, does a match, action, and count. So it'll match a flow, it'll then take an action. An action can be a rewrite, or a drop, or a punt, or any of those types of things. And then it also has counters to tell you how many of those things have actually happened. And that's what the controller will do. It just sends those messages down to the network and receives messages back from the switch. So the flow path would then match a path between server A and server B, like so. And so the controller will have decided that if server A wants to talk to server B, that it would then know how to get there. Okay. So a controller is a software program that sends and receives OpenFlow packets from your devices. The controller sends OpenFlow entries for the forwarding table. The controller must compute the flow paths. It is normally known as software-defined networking. And I will use the term software-defined networking from now on because controller is actually just one part, and that's something I'm just about to come to. So controller concepts. A controller derives a level of network convergence of previously unimaginable. Remember I talked about tightly coupled and how that everything bonds together. Because the controller actually contains an entire complete image of what the network looks like and all of its connectivity, you're going to get a bunch of convergence capabilities and, and configuration possibilities that just you couldn't imagine, right? And more importantly, because it is almost perfect for configuration and reconfiguration and ongoing configuration, it actually gives you opportunities that you can't have. I mean, how many times do we have to configure a switch port with a VLAN? You know, conf t int such and such, VLAN's this. Do we care? You know, do we really want to be able to have to do that for the rest of our working lives? Because I'm, I'm yeah. It's worth pointing out, and some people say, but what about SNMP? Why doesn't SNMP, why don't you do all this stuff with SNMP? SNMP flat out can't do configuration. This, 
it, it just doesn't have the data structure to support XML. The ASN1 notation uh, just isn't capable of exchanging data backwards and forwards that makes it viable, right? So don't get stuck with that SNMP and CLI programming is just too obscure. So if you want to send commands to an IS router, you can't match them to commands that you're going to send to a Junos against commands that you're going to send to a Brocade because they're all different for whatever reason, right? CLI scraping isn't going to work. We need some sort of abstraction to make better configuration tools, okay? Now, don't, don't let me get too full of myself here because routing has its negatives, right? Sorry, controllers have negatives. First of all, bandwidth between the controller and the device is a weakness. If you're going to constantly update, how much bandwidth is there and how reliable is it? What about the controller availability and reliability? It has to be there. That stability and trustworthiness of that device has to be tantamount. You have to be absolutely and utterly confident that it's working the way you want it to be. And then you also have to be able to understand the transaction ability of the controller to be able to process the algorithms and deliver the data down to the network in relation to the service that you want to create. And obviously the device has its own weaknesses around that, and we've talked about those previously. Now, during the break, we had a number of questions from people about controller architectures, so please wash your hands, get strapped in. We're going to hit that very, very quickly. The first model is whether we decide for centralized or distributed controllers. Now, a centralized controller would be what we would be very comfortable with as networking professionals today. That is, a controller active, controller standby, and if the controller active loses its heartbeat, the standby controller takes it out, right? And that would be exactly what we know today in a standard chassis based switch, right? There's two supervisors or two central processing engines, and if one stops responding, then the other one just takes over. That would be known as a centralized high availability controller design. It's also possible that we could have distributed controllers where all the controllers have a similar copy of the database or a similar copy of the information, and each controller signals that data to the other, and then each controller is hierarchically independent for a group of devices. So you might want to have a data center, and you have a controller that handles this row and another one that handles this row and this row, and then you have a special inter-controller signaling system where, as the databases of those actually vary, you do that. You keep them coherent. Now that is something that we already do today. It's distributed. Today it's called a caching layer in a network, a memcached type stuff, where the caching engine algorithm is actually coherent across a number of servers. That is possible, except there's a lot of real life data that's being updating here where caching is not necessarily so applicable. So for now, this is probably where we're going to go in the future, but not so easily done. And the other more obscure alternative is to actually have multi-layered so even though we still might have a controller which is distributed or centralized, we might also actually have multi-layered controllers. So each device might actually run its own controller where it processes locally a number of open flow commands. So you might have a master controller that says, yeah, yeah, your, your device, you need this. I want you to get take these and do that with it. And then you might have a controller on the device that's actually acting as a firewall and saying, so instead of punting the, the open flow request all the way up to a central controller on the wrong side of the data center or on the wrong side of your WAN network, you might go to a local controller which has a subset of rules and makes local decisions and then only punts a smaller number of decisions up to the controller. Or conceivably the central controller just actually acts as a configuration database and then leaves all the decision making to the local device. So hard to know which of these is going to go? The answer, of course, is that this is very easy to do. Centralized is very easy to do, or relatively easy to do. Distributed is very hard to do. However, as the point's been made to me recently, is that distributed computing has never been easier. In the past, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, when networking first came out, distributed computing was a, was a really difficult challenge. We now have software tools and theories and programming expertise and concepts of operation that make multi-layered networking possible in the future. I don't want to overstate this, but in the future we may see multi-layered controls. Okay, so just to summarize that, distributing computing was a major challenge, but in the last five years major developments in delivery and management of software. Today we have application examples of distributed computing where it actually works is things like Hadoop, MongoDB, blah, blah, big data. Pick out any big data fashion that's going around today and they're all distributed computing executions 
and the world's still looking to solve those. Other examples of distributed computing are Google and Amazon, for example, who do quite significant stuff there, and Yahoo. I would put it to you that distributed controllers are likely in the longer term, and big data controllers, which is a type of controller architecture where you actually feed back mammoth amounts of data from your network, and then you munge that in a big Hadoop cluster to analyze for flows and patterns in the system, and then make adaptive decisions about how your network works by feeding back flows, you know, maybe on a daily basis. You just say, hang on, if you're a carrier and you can pull back all this big data from your network and you say, hang on, instead of using MPLS TE to create tunnels across my network, why don't I just look at my flows, analyze it, run an overnight report, and then reconfigure my network by six the next day and make the most out of my system. That's a bit of a pipe dream, but that's something that could be done in the future because of the configuration-based nature of the system. Okay, I want to, we do have a form of software-defined networking today in network management systems. So just to come back to SNMP, right? SNMP works for simple data such as counters and status. We poll, poll status, poll an interface status over SNMP and we get a yes, it's up, no, it's down, right? And we get simple data, how much, how many bits went out, how many, what's the difference, you know, just keep polling a, a number and it works, right? But the problem is, is that the SNMP, which uses the SMI data format using AS1 notation for data representations, describes data formats and protocol interactions that are not transactional and are not extensible. That is, the, the data format encoded in an SMI message is limited. It doesn't say how the message is configured. It doesn't self-describe. It doesn't support it. And this was recognized about seven years ago in RFC 3535, where a number of people got together and argued it out for several days in a, in a big smelly room and decided, agreed that, and I quote, the SNMP transactional model and the protocol constraints make it more complex to implement MIBs as compared to the implementation of commands in a CLI. In other words, SNMP is not suitable for configuration. And if you want to find out more, go and read RFC 3535 and realize that SNMP is only good for polling for performance and fault data. It is no good for configuring your systems. And that's been widely agreed. Why? Because SNMP does not support retrieval and playback of configurations. It doesn't have a transactional model. There are scaling problems in SNMP with the number of objects in a device. It doesn't support arbitrarily large data sets and semantic mismatches. In other words, it's not task oriented, it's trans it's a data centric. It says, I want to poll a number, it gives you a number, but it doesn't say, make this change, do this in multiple steps and then execute that. SNMP cannot cope with that at all. And trying to program that into SNMP models just never worked, if you've ever tried it. Okay, so for SDN, the controller is regarded as the software element that interfaces to the network devices. And what I want you to do now is to introduce you to the idea of an app, right? In practice, the controller is a platform or an API for sending and receiving data from the network. It represents a core software mode or common code to be shared amongst multiple apps. And apps are those that run on top of a controller. So in reality, the controller that I've been talking about for the last hour is actually a trivial, not trivial, I mean, it's an enormously significant piece of work, but it's not where the magic happens. In the same way that in a networking device today that there's a TCAM that sits inside of your switch that does an, an enormous thing. I mean, it's an amazing piece of technology what a ternary cam can do to your network. But are you panicked about it? It's just part of the heartbeat of your system that goes. It's the OSPF and the BGP, that's what you see. And apps are the magic in an SDN. So just to enforce that, Big Switch has open sourced their Floodlight open, open Flow controller, and you can go and download it and run it up. It runs in Java. They've even got instructions on how to run it on a Mac, so you can have a bit of a look at it. So, and there are many other controllers you can have a look at. There's some more listed in the back, Knox, things like that. Very easily, very uh, go to openflowhub.org, and there's a number of listed there. Openflow Foundation has a number listed. Uh, however, Floodlight is there, and I quote, the foundation of a commercial controller that is a basis for their network virtualization app, right? And they have other apps under development. Um, and this isn't Big Switch now, this is just other companies. So there are BGP root servers for interoperating with big BGP cores. And that's a project called Rootflow. Ericsson has deployments where they are configuring an app that acts as an MPLS edge. 
In other words, it interfaces towards an MPLS network and it will integrate with the MPLS virtual circuits and make it happen. There are firewall and security at this point in time, but they're a bit limited. And there's also flow balancing. There's a project called Flow Scale, which does load balancing uh, and security functions. What flow balancing actually does is does load balancing, but also intercepts and redirects flows for munging into snort servers for IDS type stuff. Transparent redirection, proxy servers, and things like that. Today, what we actually use uh, WCCP for is a native function of OpenFlow. To get more information about IPSpace webinars, please visit ipspace.net.